Hello and welcome back to the Mainly Fly podcast. Now I'm your host, Jesse Rochester, and today we're going to be diving into the debate of using realistic flies versus general patterns, or a buggy pattern as I like to call it. But first, we're going to go over some of your guys' questions that you left in the last episode. Now, I know it's been a while since I've made the last podcast, but I've had a lot going on right now. Uh, We can get into that a little bit later, actually. I think it answers one of our questions from you guys. But I just haven't had the time needed to make these videos as often as I'd like. I'd like to uh, focus on, you know, still creating the fly tying content. And I would like to add this in as an addition. If I can get there, I'd like it to be a weekly addition. But right now that's not in the cards, but that doesn't mean... Uh, that we won't continue making them. So anyway, let's hop right into your guys' questions. So this first question comes from the username 714spoon. And actually, I believe he also suggested the topic for today's debate. And their question was, could you give an overview of the different types and sizes of threads and why they might be used over others? Yeah, that's a that's a good question that I think a lot of beginners run into. So when you look at buying thread, you can buy anywhere from... 3 aught, 6 aught, 8 aught, 12 aught, 16, and I think the smallest I've seen is 20. I'm not sure about that. And for a lot of beginners, this can be a bit of a confusing topic. Um, it's not really a measurement system outside of hooks that we're used to. And so much like hooks, what this is referring to is the width of the wire itself. So when we're talking about thread, we're talking about how th- thick that thread is. So lower on the scale, being a, let's say, 3 aught is going to be far thicker than a 16 aught. And so when it comes to selecting what size thread you're going to be using, it really comes down to how big your fly is going to be. So every thread wrap that you put with a larger size thread is going to build up more bulk. And sometimes you want this and sometimes you don't. So let's just use a size 8 hook as an example. Let's say we're tying a small bugger on a size 8. Um, So I like to select a size uh, 8 aught thread for this, typically. And that's because it's got enough strength to hold in the materials that I want, and it's not going to add up too much bulk. Uh, Sometimes, when I'm tying that exact same fly, um, let's say in this case a golden retriever, which has a prominent thread base below the estaz, then I usually bump up to a 6 aught. The reason being there is because I actually want thread buildup. I don't feel like putting in 500 wraps just to build up my body using a thicker thread can allow you to do that process in a far faster manner. And even if you don't want the head to be built up too much with that size six, you can just whip finish, snip that free and swap out to an dot thread. And that's one reason why people have a lot of different bobbins. And so they can place the threads that they use the most on, you know, five different spools and then just switch between them. That's what I do. Um, I definitely have my favorites. I don't, I don't go crazy with the threads. I usually use, I have some 6-0s, 8s, 12s, 14s, and then a couple six, uh, 16s. And the smaller I go, uh, usually I'm tying small nymph. So my favorite is, you know, 12, 14 odd. I think is a pretty good sweet spot. You get a lot of tension in there. Even if you were to nick the point of your hook, it's not going to snap it right away, especially uh, using different types of threads will come with different strengths. So that's typically what I'm using. Um, There are different types of threads. There's going to be flat threads. There's going to be round threads. And that might actually be a better discussion for a new podcast. Actually, the more I talk about this, the more I realize that there's there is a lot to selecting your threads and choosing the optimum thread for a fly you're using. So I'll only go briefly into that. Now a flat thread I really like to use if I'm building up a body. Things like ultra threads, you see me a lot use a lot of uh, ultra thread 140 and 70. I really like flat threads because they lay down nicely. Um, you can even spin your bobbin to twist them up or untwist them and it creates different effects and the, the way you tie in materials and how tight that's going to be is be, going to be affected a little bit differently as well. So that that's a little bit more of a, an experience thing. So a flatter thread offers, you know, a bigger variety of things that I can do with that thread without having to switch it out. So that could be one reason to use a, a flat thread. But also, you know, I have plenty of rounded ones and they work just as well. Don't get too hung up on which exact thread you're going to use because they all work. And it's going to be most important to select the right size. Um, so the, one of the biggest mistakes I see a lot of 
with a lot of beginner fly tires and myself included is that you're tying a pattern with a, a thread size that's just far too big for your hook so you couldn't get a clean head <laughs> as, as much as you wanted to you, it's just not possible and and that's because with a larger thread you're going to build up a ton of thread wraps and by the time you finish off the head of your fly it's just going to be this big ugly mass and it's not that that's going to matter for fish actually it probably doesn't hurt your fishing at all it's just um typically you look at the head of the fly and you can kind of judge the experience of the tire now the cleaner the head probably the more experience that they have and understand how much material is going to build up and uh, just a little more control of their thread use. And you know, you can even get around this a little bit nowadays. One of my one reason I really liked UV resin, especially when I was first not getting into fly tying, but you know, starting to progress a little bit, was that I didn't have to have a perfect head. The UV resin, if you paint it over a little bit, it's gonna flatten out all those variabilities in your thread and make it look a lot cleaner. So that's one really cool thing about it that you could utilize in your tying. Using some UV resin is at the head of the fly is definitely going to make you look like a better fly tire. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. And uh, you also brought up a couple great topics to discuss as the uh, main event of the podcast, both in uh, the one we're going to be talking about today. And also, I think I'm going to revisit this subject. Look forward to that in one of the next podcasts where we take a deeper dive into threads. I think that's a good idea. Okay, anyway, so moving on to our next question. This is from Andrew Spencer, and Andrew says, I've seen a lot of your videos and appreciate the information you provide and the new patterns I have learned throughout the videos. Well, thank you, Andrew. I'm glad you enjoy them. My question is a bit less cut and dry. I've been considering getting into fly tying and can't figure out what would be right for me. I love to fly fish, but I can't decide if I would enjoy fly tying. How did you get into fly tying? And do you have any advice for someone considering getting into the hobby? Thanks. Yeah, I, Andrew, I get asked this question quite a bit. And uh, just to go in briefly on how I got into it, I learned when I was very young, uh, probably about seven years old, I want to say, seven to 10 years old, uh, my grandfather taught me. And he, while he fly fished, he more he was more into trolling patterns. Um, we would call them like classic New England trolling patterns. Things like the black ghost, uh, gray ghosts, Mickey fins, things like that. And he would always be in his workshop creating these that he would take out onto St. Freud Lake in, in northern Maine and troll around to catch salmon and lake trout. And as well as a couple brook trout here and there too. Uh, so I learned from him. He taught me uh, how to tie my favorites. I remember I would always go fishing on the dock there catching chubs and perch <laughs> in I mean you can catch hundreds of them a night and it's how I learned to fly fish and learn very quickly if you find a species that is a lot easier to catch you know so beginners I think often want to focus on the classic trout and salmon and while that's great and all you know definitely go out and give that a shot if you really want to gain experience quickly pick a species that's easier to catch uh, because I guide and I see it on the water all the time you know, we finally dial them in, you know, to make a good cast and it's looking fine. And I know that it's only a matter of time till they get a bite, but it's really hard to prepare someone for the next step and what happens when the fish takes it. You know, the biggest loss of fish that happens is, you know, they're not setting the hook properly. And even if they do set the hook properly, all hell breaks loose, <laughs> for lack of a better term, in, you know, line control and you know, not just taking your finger and pinching that fly line right to the fly pole and having a fish snap you off. So that that can be a little bit difficult if you are new to fly fishing and is a good reason to pick a species that's easier to catch. Because I just realized I'm not answering this question at all. Uh, so yeah, I'll end that rant and move on to <laughs> the actual meat of your question. And which was, just to reorient myself, uh, do you have any advice for someone considering getting into the hobby of fly tying? Right. I always advocate for starting really cheap. And, and that's because fly tying is definitely not for everyone. I mean, I love it. I would love more people to share in the hobby of it. But at the same time, um, just like with everything else, you know, you try it and you find out, wow, yeah, that really wasn't for me. And so I've I've bought several vices from people who have done this exact same thing. You know, they buy a nice HMH vice or Regal vice and all of a sudden they realize, wow, um, that was a waste of money because I, I don't care for this at all after 
trying it for only a year. So what I would suggest is just go online, find a really cheap setup. You know, you're looking at 100 to 150 dollars max. I think that's a really good point to try out the hobby, see if you like it. You're going to have enough gear to do it. You know, all the tools are going to be pretty much similar to what I use at that price point. The only difference is you're not going to get a very good vice. It's probably going to have some wiggle to it. It's going to have some quirks about it. It might not hold your hook as well as you'd like to, but it's also going to be extremely cheap and a really good way to test the waters. See if that's something you like. And if it is, then, you know, invest some real money. And I think your second vice purchase should be a the most expensive one that you can afford. There really is a quality difference in vice as you go up. I think usually once you hit that $300 point plus, you're looking at some very good quality vices. So shoot for that. If you can't afford that, hey, you know, I was at that point too when I was in college. Then, you know, just stick with what you got or maybe shoot up to that. $200, $150 range for a vice, and you'll have something pretty decent as well. But the reason I say, you know, shoot for the high end is because if you do like fly tying and you take decent care of your vice, that's going to last you for your lifetime. It could potentially last for your children's lifetime and even their, their children. They don't degrade like other things, so it's kind of going to be a one-time purchase once you really find out you like it. And so that would be my suggestion. Start really cheap. And even if you find out you like it and you think that, you know, maybe that would have been a waste of money, that's not the case because I, I keep several $20 vices around and I either hand them out to people when they say this exact same thing. Hey, that might be something I'd like to try. I just give them my old vice and let them try it out for themselves. So if you have a friend, perhaps you could ask that and see if uh, maybe they'll let you borrow theirs. But also, uh, more se selfishly, I keep a kit all prepared and ready to go. So if I go on a week trip anywhere, I've got some spare materials in there. I've got that cheap vice uh, that I don't care about. If TSA decides that they're going to keep it, then they can have it. Um, but yeah, so I'll, I'll bring that around place to place. And that way, when you're on the water, you know, you always run into one bug that you just didn't anticipate, especially when you're traveling. And it's nice to, to go home that night and tie that up. So that could be a really good use of that cheaper vice as well, is just, just create yourself a travel kit that you can bring everywhere. Uh, so thank you for that question. And let's go to the next one. Uh, yes, this is from Half Insane Outdoor Guy. And his question is, will you cover the use of using scents on your flies? I ran into a man who stored his flies for the next day in a bottle of power bait. He said you're cheating yourself on the river, and then he specifies the river, but I won't say that. If you're not both covering your own scent, the scent of the glues and epoxies, and giving yourself a bit leg up on the fish by using scent. So this is an interesting topic, and to be quite honest, not one I've considered a whole lot. But I think using scents on your flies is completely up to the fishermen. I can tell you right now that this, I actually might put this in a video because much like the band thing, I think this is a really good controversial topic of debate in fly fishing. Now, I, I don't hear about it too much, but I do know just by knowing the community that this is definitely going to be something that a lot of people are going to frown upon. And the reason being is because I, I think the major reason is that a lot of fly fishermen really like the challenge of that fly fishing presents. You know, we could just pick up a spin rod a lot of us are really drawn to that extra little challenge um, that fly fishing presents in many different aspects. Uh, but that said, you know, if I saw someone on the water who was pulling flies out of a power bait tube, I'd probably say more power to him. He's going to, you know, most likely catch more fish than I am that day. And if that's your goal, if you're out on the water to catch as many fish as possible, then yeah, scenting your flies might be a good idea. Um, but that's going to be up to you as to whether that's something you want to do or not. I'm not aware of any laws that specify that you can't, um, but a lot of fish are scent oriented. It can help draw them to a specific location, saying that there's food there. I would say that, yes, this probably would help you catch fish. There's no doubt about that. But I bet you that this is going to be more beneficial in a still water setting versus a river. Um, that's because, you know, a fish in still water it's, it's a big area, and they probably rely more on scent as to orient themselves to where their food might be or if something is food because they're going to have more time to look at it. In a river, fish are virtually a fast river. They're very opportunistic. You know, they're hiding in this little or behind this rock waiting for food to drift by in the current, and they have to identify that food and decide that they want to eat it 
in a split second. Otherwise, that food's going to drift downstream and they might not be able to catch it. So I don't think scent's going to come into play much in that scenario. Um, and the only reason I bring that up is because that's, you know, I like rivers. I mostly fish in rivers. Um, but if you were indicator fishing in a still water, man, I bet this is going to be a far more effective technique than just using your flies uh, without scent. So yeah, this is another topic I think I could really dive into one day. That'd be kind of fun. But uh, just to sum it up, I've never used it on my flies. I think it's up to you. I don't think there's any laws on it. Um, but yeah, it probably will catch you a few more fish. So yeah, I guess you can make that decision for yourself. Thank you for that question. And let's go to the next one. And I believe this is the last question that we have for the day before we go to the main topic. This is from Eric Bergman. So Eric asks, what do you think about adding UV materials to your flies? I took my UV flashlight into a fly shop and shined it on various materials that had UV in the name. And some of these did glow when I hit them with the light and others did not. And other things were not called UV, but really glowed quite hot. So what's the deal with UV? Those of you who don't know, so we're not talking about UV resin here. We're talking about UV materials. So things that are fluorescing under UV light. And this has become a big thing in fishing and fly fishing lately, is adding, the, you know, they'll put this little sticker that says UV material or UV fluorescent, and <laughs> thinking that it's going to be this, you know, end-all, be-all, catch more fish with it. And this is, it's an interesting topic because, so UV materials, let's just go give a little backstory here. So UV materials aren't new. In fact, you know, if you look around your room, and you find brighter items, those are most likely going to fluoresce in UV. Things like oranges or bright pinks, high-vis colors like you would see on a construction worker. Things like that are going to be naturally UV fluore uh, fluorescent, and uh, even some whites can as well. So there, there's natural materials out there that do fluoresce in, under the UV spectrum. So the funny part is, I think some people think this is a modern addition to fishing. No, it's not new. Uh, natural things in our environment will reflect UV light, and this is considered to be um, a UV material or UV reflectant. One particular color that comes to mind is yellow. So yellow, if you shine, if you have some yellow deer hair laying around or anything of the sort, if you shine your UV light on that, chances are it's going to be glowing pretty hot. Same thing with oranges. Some pinks will do that as well. Actually, quite a few pinks. And even chartreuse, which is, you know, similar to yellow. And so anyway, modern materials have really decided that this is going to be a new marketing thing and adding UV to anything is going to make it automatically fish better. Now, I use UV in a lot of my stuff just because I think it's, it's really cool. It has a nice effect. It looks good. But as far as to whether or not that's actually getting fish to bite, I'm not so convinced on. And so I'm speaking from, I read an article on this. I think last year. So I'm, I'm speaking more off of that thought. I don't have too much experience in, in fish vision, let's say. But fish don't really see the UV spectrum much, much like us. Um, there is a time period where they do. And so I guess younger fish are able to see in UV. Why that's the case, I'm not really 100% sure. But as they mature, they start to lose that ability. So they don't actually see the UV spectrum. So whether you put it in your fly or not, they're not necessarily going to be able to see that effect. They might be able to see something better that is UV reflected, just simply because its color is going to be brighter in the sunlight or something of the sort. But as far as the UV goes, they actually can't see it at all. Um, I don't know if that's true for all species, though. I do remember that this was specifically about trout and salmon. That would be something that I would have to research. But that said, you know, uh, how the vision of a fish work is works is definitely not my expertise so if you do happen to know more about that leave a comment because I'd, I'd love to hear about it anyway so that actually includes all of our questions for this episode so for those of you who left some thank you so much and if you would like to have your question answered in the next podcast so leave it in the comments below and we'll cover it in our next podcast all right so now let's get into the main topic of debate today so we're going to be talking about the difference between realism or flies that look very realistic compared to what you're trying to imitate in nature or a general pattern something that just represents a buggy insect you know it's got hair sticking out everywhere it's got the shape of a fly but it doesn't necessarily look like anything besides a lint ball and so we're going to be kind of comparing these two and this this is a bit of a debate in fly fishing but not so much i think that 
There's definitely a general consensus here that we'll get into, but we'll kind of flesh it out a little bit first. So, so first, you know, let's let's talk about realistic patterns. So this is going to be something that looks a lot like the fly that we're trying to represent. So if you can think of a mayfly, uh, if we were going to create a fly that looks realistic to this, we're going to have the three pronged tail. Uh, let's just say it's a an adult. So we're going to have a nice looking wing and a the exact size of the body, its color. It's got legs sticking out, everything. Um, it's just a picture perfect mayfly. And there's a lot of, of emerging companies. I mean, they've been established for a bit now, and I'm not too sure of you know how much history there is here, but places like Frosty Fly or Hemingway Fly Company are creating fly materials that are very realistic. Um, just for example, like the extended body on a mayfly. I think both of these places create their own version of them that are extremely realistic. They have the exact size dimensions and tails and even add in some specific coloring that makes it look just extremely realistic. And, you know, if, if tied right at a glance, I don't even think I'd be able to tell the difference. And I've seen some very impressive flies using this. But, you know, as one of the cons of this, and, and this isn't just mayflies, you know, they do this for, I've seen caddis flies, house flies, dragonflies, pretty much any major insect, I think there's going to be some sort of variation that someone's made to look like the exact bug. And so while they look very real, a lot of these aren't made out of natural materials. They're just pre-made synthetic materials that you just grab the body itself, in the case of the mayfly, tie the tag end in, I think they're probably made out of foam, and there you go. You know, all you have to do is add in a couple wings, dub up the body a little bit, and uh, you have a fly pattern. So they definitely look realistic, and the fish isn't really going to be able to tell the difference at all, but is that actually going to catch you more fish? Um, so a buggy pattern on the opposite hand. Um, so you hear me use the term a nice buggy look a lot. So just to get it out of the way, I'm very biased towards these flies, and the reason being is that a buggy or a general pattern is made to look like just about anything in the water. So a lot of these general patterns, they use natural hair. Um, they're going to be very simple. They'll probably use some hair, a little bit of flash maybe if it's an attractor pattern, a piece of wire to help hold the hair down, and maybe a, a hotspot collar or a different color collar and a bead or, you know, maybe without a bead. But they're very general patterns. So an example of a nymph would be a hair's ear. Hair's ear is a very general pattern that uh, is usually more represented of a mayfly, but it could look like a bunch of things. It could look like a stonefly, could look like a betis nymph in smaller sizes and different colors. And the benefit from this is if you don't know what's in the water, or if there's a lot of things that the fish are feeding on, using a general pattern is likely to get more bites because uh, the fish can see what they want to see. So now all of a sudden you're not matching a perfect mayfly nymph. You're putting out a pattern that might look like a little bit like a mayfly nymph, but it also might look like a stonefly. And so now it's up to the fish to decide what it looks like and whether or not they're feeding on it. So generally speaking, I would say that these are a little more productive because they're a little more versatile than just using something that looks like an exact single insect. So just to give a couple examples, you know, if I'm visiting a new place and, you know, let's say I go online, I Google up this river, it's a major river that a lot of people fish. So there's plenty of information that fly shops have as to what you might find in that river at a specific period of time. So there's going to be things like, let's just say there's caddis, mayflies, stoneflies, all the major things that you're going to find in a lot of different trout rivers. And so I might not know exactly what the phenotypes of those insects look like there, you know, they might have some different size variations, different color variations, but going into that fishing trip, I would just, I have uh, different fly boxes. Um, some of them I have labeled for specific rivers and others are just general fly boxes for in my state of Maine or just, you know, a general fly box that I can grab and go and use wherever and it's going to work. Um, so when I'm visiting somewhere, going to a river I'm not familiar with, I tend to grab these general patterns because I know that it's got everything I need to match mayfly profiles and caddis profiles, stoneflies, stuff like that, and let the fish decide whether or not that's going to be something that they're going to eat. Versus if you go super realistic, you better know exactly what's in that water. Fish will still probably eat it from time to time, but I think that Going general just gives you a lot better chance than choosing something specific. But, 
you know, you can definitely make cases for using realistic flies. One specific example, I, so I guide in a river here in Maine, and it's full of landlocked salmon. And there, there's a funny difference between landlocked salmon and brook trout where we are. So the landlocked salmon are extremely picky compared to brook trout. But brook trout are opportunistic fish. I mean, it doesn't really matter what passes in front of them. If it looks like something they can eat, they're going to try it. Yeah, far more opportunistic than landlocked salmon. Landlocked salmon will be extremely picky. In the fall, they're going to be a little more focused on breeding and can be quite stubborn. But in the springtime, they're actually in our rivers to feed. And what's funny is when I harvest a few, I usually clean out the, the stomach to see what type of contents are in there. And with landlocked salmon, I've never seen something that's fed so specifically. I mean, I've opened up landlocked salmon and only found a single insect in a single color. And that's all they were eating. So in these cases, and on this river, I actually do carry very realistic, specific patterns for the landlocked salmon. I, you know, I've, I've fished there several years now and spent months <laughs> on the river at all different times of year. So whenever I go there, I know roughly what insects are going to be hatching within a one to two week time frame, depending on weather and water levels and, you know, of course, typical variables like that. But as far as what's in that river goes... I really know um, what bugs are going to be there. And if you're that familiar with your river, then having realistic fly patterns can absolutely play in your favor, especially when you're working with picky fish. Uh, so if you know that a size 16 mayfly in a light green is going to be there and, you know, it's a reoccurring hatch every single year and that the fish are just gorging on them, then there's no reason not to tie a perfect looking mayfly in order to match the hatch. And the, the drawback is, and why I don't just only use those patterns, is largely because of how much time they take. You know, a general buggy pattern might just be a couple different things, like we mentioned before, maybe a little bit of hair's ear, a wire, and then a different color of hair's ear on a bright gold bead. And that, you know, that only takes me maybe three minutes to spin up. But a realistic fly pattern, like a, a highly intensive mayfly with separated tails, the legs, you know, everything, that might take me 15 to 20 minutes to tie. So that that's a long time to tie, you know, in an hour, I only get to produce three flies versus in the other buggy variation, I could tie a whole row, you know, two dozen flies in several different colors and sizes, which would be of more benefit to me for that hour uh, spent at the vice than three flies that look exactly perfect. Uh, so you, <laughs> I think you got to weigh your odds. Are you fishing a really high pressured area where that realistic fly might do you a favor and you know exactly what's going to be hatching that week? Or would a faster fly pattern to tie that's going to, you know, be appealing to more fish and you can even tie up more variations in colors and sizes. That tends to tip the scale as far as I'm concerned is, you know, that's the way to go. So all most of my fly boxes are filled with buggy things with the occasional realistic fly because they are just, you know, they're fun to tie and they're nice to look at in the fly box. But that said, it it doesn't correlate to catching more fish. I really think those buggy flies are just the way to go. But, you know, if you're into just a good looking fly box, it can be fun to have a really pretty one. My problem is, you know, when you're when you spend 20 minutes to tie up a fly and that fly gets caught on a rock, it really hurts my soul to snap that off and walk away. Uh, so, you know, that's up to you. If if that's what you want to do and fill your box with realistic flies that, uh, that you've tailor built to that river or your state to cover, you know, all your bases, then hey, go for it. More power to you. But for a person who goes fishing often, you know, I, I leave the river, even a river I know well. I know where the snags are and all that. I still typically lose, you know, at least three to five flies a day somehow or another. And if, in particular, if I go to a small brook trout streams with lots of overhangs, snags everywhere that I don't know well, oh man, I can lose a lot of flies on a day like that. And, and so those buggy patterns, you know, if I have to snap some off to get close to the, the snags or the, the hiding spots that these brook trout love, then I have no problem with it. And not only are those general patterns, you know, likely working to catch more fish, but I'm also, I don't want to say more confident, but I, I feel better about drifting them in places where I might not get that fly back. And I think that results in a lot more takes because especially for brook trout, they love hidden areas and you really got to get close to them in case they're not seeing it. So that's one reason I really like buggy patterns. Another reason is durability. You know, these realistic flies, 
You can certainly tie them durable, but a lot of them are a little bit more delicate than my buggy ones, especially uh, the buggy ones never looked perfect to begin with. They have hairs hanging off in all directions, CDC, so even if the fish starts to tear that fly up, it really didn't change it a whole lot versus a realistic fly. If you get a tooth in the wrong spot, it might just mess up that whole pattern. And um, so I think I've, I've kind of directed this in my mind more about nymphs a lot, but I think uh, when realism comes to play, a lot of people often like to have realistic dry flies, thinking that that's going to help them a lot. But, you know, if, if, it's, if you happen to be outside, if you have one of your flies, Take that fly, hold it up. Don't stare directly at the sun, but hold it roughly where the light's coming from and look up at your fly. It's basically just a shadow. You know, you're not really seeing too much color and what comes through is profile. So as far as I'm concerned about my dry flies is I only think about profile when it comes to my fishing flies. You know, I, I have a fly tying channel where I just love to tie up complex stuff occasionally, uh, but ultimately it's going to come down to the profile. So my fly box is filled with things like Griffiths gnats, um, parachute atoms, elk hair caddis, extended body mayflies, you know, whatever's in my area, midges, basically covering the bases of what the major hatches that I see around my area and in the state of Maine. And so I, I think a lot of people will focus realistic flies on these dry flies. And honestly, it makes less sense to me as a dry fly than it does as a nymph, especially in the wings. You see all these beautiful wings, but it really, when a fish is looking up and all it's really seeing is a profile, it's not until those last one foot to six inches that that fly sees decent definition of it and maybe even a little bit of color at this point. Um, and so these are the last minute refusals that you get. Maybe your profile and size wasn't quite right. Uh, but yeah, those last minute refusals is mostly because in the fish's vision, it's super blurry at four to six feet. But all of a sudden, once it comes up in that last foot to six inches, you get that fish that turns right around and it, it just noticed something that it didn't quite like. And that usually comes down to the size or the profile. Even if it was a realistic pattern, that still might get refused, even though it looks picture perfect. In, and that's often just because the size of it wasn't quite right. And so the fish is feeding off this hatch of a specific size of bugs that it expects to see. But a lot of times what they're doing is they see debris float by all the time. They're just avoiding the hassle of inhaling another stick or a piece of leaf or something. So they ended up just looking for a very specific fly, something that they've fed on before. They know that hatch is going on. And so they just seek out more of it just because it's what's available to them. So when it comes to dry flies, I think that, you know, if you get a refusal, usually the answer is just sizing down. And if you have tied up these very re realistic flies and, you know, maybe you didn't have enough time to tie up a shorter extended body for that mayfly and the fish just aren't taking that one. It's going to be a little bit harder than just using a parachute atoms and sizing that down because you can tie twice as many in the same amount of time. So just to sum it up, you know, I've, I think I've, I've ragged on realistic flies a lot, but the funny thing is I absolutely love to tie them. I don't like to make big batches of them, but they make for really good videos. I, I think that people love to see I'm um, starting from a hook and ending in all of a sudden, wow, I'm looking at this, this real bug. So I, I do that quite a bit on my fly tying channel. But as far as a fishing standpoint goes, I would argue that that's probably, you know, when you go look at my videos and you want something to tie, the uglier it looks, I bet you, actually, I, I pretty much guarantee it. I fish that one more than the most realistic looking flies on my channel. So as far as I'm concerned, buggy flies are the way to go. Uh, but that being said, of course, nothing's ever black or white. There's a place for it all in your fly box. If you know that river really well, you know what bugs are going to be there, you know their color, you know their size, and you just want to have just a beautiful, perfected fly box that you can take out knowing you have what you need, then hey, by all means, spend your winter creating these works of art that you're going to use to catch those fish. Uh, but at the same time, also build yourself a general fly box, things with hot spots, which is a point that I didn't make, but you know, a realistic fly, I feel like I'm backtracking now, but I think this is important too. So in addition to a realistic fly, you know, looking like that exact insect, it's going to be usually flat toned. It's going to be browns, olives, blacks, whatever blends in well with your river. Cause of course, you know, these insects, they don't feel like getting eaten. So they take on camouflage that helps them not get spotted. 
But in fly tying, a lot of times what we do is we add a little bit of flash to our patterns. We add a little bit brighter colors. And, you know, these are things like gold, uh, pink, oranges, chartreuse, colors that don't really exist in nature in most cases. But fish do notice them. And once they notice that, it'll help capture their attention. And then they see that, oh, it's this general profile that I've been looking for, and they might take it. Or if they don't take it, if you're fishing a double nymph rig or a dry dropper, then maybe they'll take that natural midge that you have floating just below it. So that's, that's one advantage, I think, or another advantage that would go to general patterns. Of course, you can do this with your realistic patterns, but then that kind of defeats the purpose of it, I suppose. Again, just to sum it up, I think that general patterns are generally the way to go. Uh, but of course, there is a place for both of them in your fly box, especially if you enjoy tying those realistic patterns. But yeah, maybe tie up a, a box of realistic flies that you, you commonly see in your waters. But then at the same time, make a whole nother box just stocked full of all the possibilities that you can encounter as far as size and color goes. And then also you can use some brighter colors in those as well to help attract attention. Yeah, much like anything else in fly fishing, there's a room for both of them. Um, but as far as going to a new river or just picking one in general, general fly patterns are going to be the way to go. These, as I like to call them, buggy flies are going to catch you far more fish. And you don't have to take my word for it if you talk to any competition angler or look at what competition anglers are using in their fly boxes. There is a good reason that a lot of times they don't look like anything in particular. You know, they use a lot of CDC, bright colors, and just match different profiles. And uh, they're all very simple to tie, often have a hot spot, and are excellent producers, even though they're very simple, even durable too. Uh, so yeah, if you ever get the chance, look up these competition flies uh, just to see what those look like. And they, they generally take on this very uh, simple buggy look without too much detail in them. And there's a reason that a lot of these top competition anglers are using these flies versus something that's very specific looking. Um, and that's just because those don't win competitions. They, you know, these buggy patterns, they just catch more fish. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. I suppose, like, once again, I could have collected my thoughts on this a little bit more, but this is definitely something that I'm quite opinionated about as far as which one works better, but much like everything else, there's a place for both. Uh, so anyway, thank you all for listening in to today's episode. I do hope you enjoyed it. And remember, if you have a question for our next podcast, make sure you go down below, leave it in the comments. And even if you have a topic suggestion for the next videos, uh, I will try to make those sooner than I did this last one. And as we pass June, I'm going to have a lot more time freed up. So I'll be able to make more of these videos as well as more content across all my channels. So something to look forward to. I know I'm certainly looking forward to getting back into this uh, full time. So thank you all once again. I hope your spring fishing is off to a great start and I will catch you in the next one.